Hello again, uh, it's Rob Ryder, and today we have uh, Ring Knocker, Lieutenant Nolan, United States Marine Corps, graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Good for you, sir. Uh, who's now Reverend Nolan of the Roman Catholic Church in Littleton, Colorado, the United States. Well, I can't think of anybody better, sir, to share the things I need to talk about with somebody than somebody like you. And uh, so hopefully somebody that's watching the video will, I don't know, send an email to the church or whatever and just try to get the lieutenant's uh, attention. And if you're watching, sir, well, thank you. Because I needed to tell you, sir, that professionals' acts of bad faith are devouring your flock. However, the Department of War and Navy gave the church authority to prosecute the sin. And this isn't the first time I talked about this, or I got lots of videos. I, I, my last video was talking to a, a member of the Greek uh, Orthodox, well, the Orthodox Church. I don't know if I should say Greek or not, but uh, of the Orthodox Church. Um, but hey, you know, <laughs> you're a Lieutenant United States Marine Corps. That, uh, that's a golden ticket for what we're talking about here. So uh, beware, a wolf in sheep's clothing is a lawyer in a church pew. Right, because a lawyer has a license and uses his license to take advantage of people. Well, that's directly against the uh, the golden rule. And so, you know, I'm not just picking on lawyers, although I am, because you know they they as esquires are really the ones running the show for the British Crown, which uh, is the owner of the United States of America, which is not the same as the United States, sir. Right, but it's the United States of America. So there's, uh, you know, things that I mean, no one ever told me these when I was growing up. So I don't know if you've ever heard them or not. So I'm going to tell them to you on Tuesday, February fifteenth, twenty twenty two. And I am Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rutluski, United States Army veteran, also known as Rob Ryder. Uh, but you can just call me Rob, and uh, or Staff Sergeant Rutluski is good too. Email is quarter record at aol.com. Uh, phone number 616-712-6179. I hope to hear from you, sir, because, uh, you know, we have things to share. So I want to show you really quick, just to prove to you, right, that the Department of War and Navy gave the church some authority. Somebody gave the church authority. And uh, the easiest proof, sir, is next time uh, you're in <laughs> here in church, right, just turn around and look behind you. There's a gold fringe flag, United States. What the heck is that doing in a Catholic church? Now, it's just not in a Catholic church. I mean, all churches, uh, as we'll see, many churches have a gold fringe flag. And it was given to them as part of this jurisdiction that it represents. Uh, back in 1917, maybe it was 1918, in that time frame there, the department, uh, well, first of all, all the churches, created some sort of civil organization. And the Catholic churches, uh, what they did is they created a thing called the National Catholic War Council. Right? Well, that organization was given a commission by the War Department. It didn't come from Congress. It came from the War Department because the United States was at war. We're under, you know, we're under military rule, basically. And... Um, well, there you are. And there's, and there's, you know, it's more than just a symbol. It has a reason. But one of the things about this flag is it doesn't, it's not a freaking decoration. There's only certain places that it can be displayed. And by army regulation, they're all, they're all tied to the freaking military. All right? So this room has military jurisdiction. Because we really don't have a civilian government, sir. I mean, there's a lot to tell you today, but we don't have a civilian government. None of these people are taking a proper oath of office, right? They may pretend to take an oath of office, but they don't do it in their full legal name, and it's not the oath that satisfies the sixth article of the Constitution. Actually, it's the oath that was supposed to be used by Confederate soldiers or uh, people loyal to the Confederacy after the war for them to be involved in the government, again, of the United States. That's the oath they're taking, but they're not taking an oath to satisfy the sixth article of the Constitution, which would still have been a requirement, right? This oath they take is just for them to be able to 
hold an office, but it isn't the oath that holds the office or you know gives the authority through the office. There's a special oath that was written. And then after all that is all said and done, they have to have a document that has a certain testimonial on the uh, at the end of it that made it uh, uh, letters patent. Right? It's, uh, believe it or not, there's uh, apparently there's a law that says they have to do these things. So let's take a look at some of this, right? Because this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a false system called the United States of America in the United States uh, that's oppressing all the citizens of the United States. Right? But, you know, sure enough, that's a gold fringe flag. Uh, 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 can't deny that there's a gold fringe flag in the Catholic Church. So how did it get there? And why is it there? Let's see if we can figure that out. Hang on just a second. I want to stop real quick here. This is uh, Lieutenant Nolan, right now Reverend Nolan, who did a video not too long ago, January 30th, right? Government has lied to us before. Then you answered your own question, sir, how it could happen. Well, because the government's lied to us before. We're being lied to now, but we're really not being lied to by the government because the government is dormant, right? There's nobody there. There is no civilian government. We're supposed to have a government run by the military, but uh, I think that what happened is during the uh, Reconstruction period, the, all the federal troops left, uh, you know, the Confederate states, basically. And uh, that was a mistake because now all the states are Confederate states. And they're all acting under this uh, parallel jurisdiction while pretending to be the government of the United States. Well, sir, that would be treason. Right? And uh, I'm not just saying it because I think it. I'm going to show it to you. So let me get busy with that. Hang on. So, sir, if you went to uh, YouTube to Rob Ryder with three Bs, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R, -B 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 -E um, you see I have you know many, many videos, over 400 videos. Um either talking about things that are wrong in America by showing the documentation that they're wrong or attempting to try something to, you know, solve one of these issues that's happened in the past and so forth and so on. So there's, you know, lots of good information. Uh, for instance, veterans' records are a matter of national security. This is, you know, one of the things we'll be talking about today. Um, in fact, let me show you that. Hang on a second. Eh, belay that order. We'll get to it later. Ah, uh, here, Archbishop Vigano. Here, a U.S. veteran. Maybe you'd want to watch that one. Um, and then all sorts of things about uh, lately having to do with the procedure that, uh, like, attorneys are supposed to follow when, in a court case. You know, the court has rules, and here's the rules. That's what they're supposed to do. And when you start reading the rules and look at what they're doing, it's like, well, they're not following the rules. All right, well, that's an act of bad faith. Right, so this is, you know, there's plenty of evidence of bad faith. It's just, well, who do you tell to get somebody to do something about it? Because, unfortunately, they're all Esquires all the way up to, uh, you know, to the Supreme Court. And an Esquire, by definition, is an officer, uh, is a uh, crown agent of the British crown. And way down below them is this guy called a mister. You know, we're in a different class than the Esquires. So they always want me to be a mister or a ms, right? But they don't want to call you by your full legal name. They don't even want to acknowledge you by your full legal name. Like mine's Robert Allen Rutluski, right? That's what's supposed to be on your birth record. Although I don't even know because they don't really give you the proper birth record. They give you a certificate of live birth, which is supposed to be used for adoptions. And I've looked at lots of people's paperwork, sir. They're all certificates of live birth. Right? It's part of a scheme, part of a system that's been in place for a long time that we were born into, has us trapped in this parallel jurisdiction called the United States of America. While the United States is there, the symbol of it is that flag behind you, and it's that flag that gives you the authority to do something in the United States. I don't have that flag behind me, so I don't have the authority in the United States. I need to go to somebody. And that's what I'm saying. That's what you guys are for. That's what the churches are for. That's what they did back uh, at the beginning of World War One. And so some of the reasons I say these things, sir, let's just, uh, I'm going to 
just pop through a bunch of different things, right? So here's, uh, this is called the Libra Code. You're probably familiar with it. General Orders Number 100, Instructions for the Government of Armies of the United States, right? United States of America, of the United States in the field. And, uh, you know, it says in Article 2 that martial law does not cease during the hostile occupation except by special proclamation ordered by commander-in-chief or by a special mention in a treaty of peace. Now, I don't know if that means there's two, three different ways or two different ways. All right? Special proclamation ordered by the commander-in-chief or a special proclamation, comma, and then an order by the commander-in-chief. That would be the second way, special mention of peace treaty. Well, this was written in 1863 before the end of the Civil War, and we know that there was no peace treaty. There may have been an armistice, but that's just a prolonged ceasefire. Uh, there's never been a proclamation written, and, uh, you know, I've never seen any order of a commander-in-chief. And so, you know, basically the martial law had been in place since the Civil War, right, domestically. Well, then we go to World War I, and uh, Congress declares war. And, um, well, let's look at, I'll show you that stuff specifically. Hang on just a second. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to what Congress did in just a second. But let's look at this really, because this just blows me away. Army University Press, right? This is an Army military website where it says, they're talking about writing style manuscripts. This is for people who want to have stuff, um, you know, put into their university press. Where it says, um, oops, sorry about that. It says, similarly, citizens in states who remained loyal to the United States did not at all feel a strong, did not all feel a strong commitment towards dissolving the institutions of slavery, nor did they believe Lincoln's views represented their own. Thus, while the historiography uh, has traditionally referred to the Union, in the uh, American Civil Wars as the Northern States loyal to the United States government, the fact that it is that that term union always referred to all the states together, which is clearly not the situation at all. In light of this, the reader will discover that the word union, it's supposed to be all of them, will largely be replaced by the more historically accurate federal government or U.S. government, Union forces or Union Army will largely be replaced with the terms U.S. Army, Federals, or Federal Army. Well, I used to wear a uniform that said U.S. Army on it, right? That is a, according to this, that would make it historically correct to say that we're in the Civil War because my uniform says U.S. Army. It doesn't say Union forces, right? Federal government, if they're using that term, that was used as part of the Civil War. And that's what we use today. Right, so um, is is what it is. So here's a little bit more of things that it is, right? This is 105 stat 44, right? So uh, volume 105 of the statutes at large, page 44, which is supposed to be the laws of the United States, sir. Public law 102 14, March 20, 1991, joint resolution where it goes on to say Congress recognizes the historical and traditional tradition of ethical values and principles, which are the basis of civilized civilization, uh, civilized society and upon which our great nation was founded. Whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. Can we just stop for a minute, sir, and say, well, I'm not under the seven Noahide laws. I'm not a Jew. And yet Congress is saying, no, that's the basis of our civilized society and upon which our great nation was founded. Now, I thought our great nation was founded on the Constitution. But apparently the people who call themselves Congress say it's the Noahide laws. Well, then they must not be the Congress of the United States. And they're not. They're the Congress of the United States of America. They're not taking a proper oath to office to be the Congress of the United States. Uh, one, uh, public law 10214. Um, yeah, if you, you know, you Google this, sir, you'll find all sorts of history on this. But uh, this is what we're dealing with, right? This is, um, we're being judged by the Noahide laws as a Christian. 
by Jews who would say Christians are blasphemers from the beginning. Well, that doesn't work out well for us. So I don't want to be in their jurisdiction. And the church, with the gold fringe flag, back to the United States, I believe is the way we get back into the proper jurisdiction. We get on the other side of Union lines. See, right now, Union lines are behind us, right? They're to your back. But eventually, they'll be in front of you, and we'll be on the right side of the freaking flag. Let's look at a few more proofs of things not being the way they're meant to be, right? This is the Constitution of the, of the United States. The Constitution laws of the United States, which shall be made pursuant thereof, and all treaties made, which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution laws of any state, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Well, they don't follow anything to do with the Constitution in court, sir. They follow... Um, uh, what do they call it? Case made law. Right? They're not following the Constitution or laws of the States. It's just, well, whatever they did last time, they set a precedent. That's what we're going to do again. It's called case law. Right? It's a foreign system of uh, adjudicating a case to the United States. It's just proof that that court is not a court of the United States because it's not judging by the laws. Now, maybe it could, right? But it needs to have the paper from the people from the Gold Fringe Flag Society to, you know, to put them in the proper hat. We'll get on that in a, more in a minute. Uh, senators, representatives before mentioned. But here's here's the big one. So the the senators and representatives before mentioned and members of the several state legislatures and all exec all A L L executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as qualification of office, public trust, under the United States. Right? So they can't, ha they cannot make you take an oath with the religious test, such as, so help me God in it, to be an officer of the United States. Now, the interesting thing is military officers are not executive officers of the United States. They used to be until 1948 or 49 when they created the uh, uh, security state, right? National security state. And uh, then they made it the DOD uh, heads were supposed to be officers of the United States, but military officers, you know, commissioned military officers became military officers instead of executive officers. So you don't have the same, so the military officer doesn't have the same requirement to do this particular oath that everybody else has to, such as the senators and representatives. Okay, so well, uh, let's look at this oath they're supposed to take. Just a second. Right, uh, laws of the United States. This is the very first law written, sir, after the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, June 1st, 1789. Commonly known as 1 Stat 23. Uh, being enacted by the Senate, House of Representatives uh, of the United States of America, and Congress assembled that the oath or affirmation required by the Sixth Article of the Constitution of the United States shall be administered in the form following, to wit, I state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. All right? Swear or affirm, as case may be, da 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 da. But that's the end of it, right? That is the form of the oath. This is the only oath that satisfies the Sixth Article of the Constitution. And you, we could go on to read this act, and it will say that it's for everybody, you know, the sixth article. Well, we just saw that's officers of the state also. So it'd be a state judge or the governor or secretary of state, or you could name them all. They're all supposed to have taken this oath, sir, and not a one of them has. And it goes on to make it their duty to have done so, right? They have to have the proof that they did it. Okay, well, then there's this next law we'll look at, which is after the laws were codified and taken from the statutes at large and then put into a, they call it the United States Code, where they gave this one particular section, Title IV, right, which has to do with the flag and the seal and the seat of government and the states, right, Section 101, 
every member of state legislature and every executive and judicial officer of a state shall, before he proceeds to execute the duties of his office, take an oath in the following form. I state your name, shall I swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. There it is again, same oath, sir. Well, when you go asking for these people's oaths, which many people have, and I've done many videos because I asked the governor for hers, and what they sent me back wasn't this, so no matter what she did, she didn't do this one, so she didn't satisfy the sixth article of the Constitution. That means she's not the governor of the state of Michigan, right? Lowercase state or state of Michigan, when state is used to represent that it's a uh, organized state of the republic, not state of Michigan when that's the name of something, which is you know, really what they do. They call this business they created the state of Michigan. So, you know, sneaky, sneaky. And then just one last one here, Treaty of Peace, 1783, right, which says that, uh, this is King George III talking, that he's the king of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, Duke of Brunswick and Lewenburg, arch-treasurer and prince elector of the Holy Roman Empire, and of the United States of America. Well, there you are. He, his successors, who's now the Rothschilds, own the United States of America. Uh, Crown of Great Britain said, uh, you know, because it's... It talks about the United States in this, and it talks about the United States of America. So they're obviously they're two different jurisdictions. We should be in the United States, but we're not because the people in the United States of America lie, cheat, and steal, and believe it's okay to cheat a Gentile in um, business or law. Right? The seven Noahide laws are the basis of the uh, Talmud. And, uh, and, 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 and as I remember, they had to wait until England defeated France so that Prince George III could be the king of both of these because he had the uh, right of peace treaty between France and him and then us and him and so forth and so on. And so you got this little circus going on here between Britain claiming to be, you know, for a short period of time, both the king of France and the king of uh, Great Britain. Okay, so we saw the oath they're supposed to take. Now, what page is this? Page four. This is uh, the congressional record. You know, you can find this online. Just Google congressional record, and you can search by the days. And this particular day is uh, Thursday, January 28th, 2021. Now, it's an odd day to be doing this because, you know, what we're going to look at is them filing their oath, and that should have been what they did on the first day that they met. And it looks like they did do something there, but, you know, we'll just look at this for a second. So here we go. What does this say? Missed it. Right here. So they're doing the business of the day, and they get to an adjournment, and the speaker pursuant to some section, right? She adjourns and says, we're going to be back together on uh, Monday. The first. Right? And uh, what? The, and today's the 28th. So I don't know how many days difference that was. But, you know, looks like over the weekend. But they adjourn for the day. Well, now that they've adjourned, they're acting like they're going to put their oaths of office into the record. And it says the oath of office required by the Sixth Article of the Constitution of the United States, comma, and as provided by this other section, comma, to be administered to the members. Well, this one that they did, IAB, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States, it's really the same oath that a commission officer takes. But this is the oath that was uh, used after the Civil War to allow people who had been loyal to the uh, Confederacy to hold an office again in the United States. But this said they had to take the oath to satisfy the Sixth Article of the Constitution and this oath. Well, they didn't do the oath. For the, for, they did not do the oath for the Sixth Article, as we can see, because that's really, really short. All right, that was just this right here. 
I state your name, you say, I swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Well, that's not what we're looking at. Right? And this says, so help me God, which is a religious test. So, this cannot satisfy the Constitution. And yet it has an I with an AB, so now they're supposed to put their name in, and that's what this is showing now. Well, then this is the name that these people were putting in that blank. And I say, well, this isn't anybody's name. It may be a nickname, but it's not your legal name. We're all supposed to have a legal name. It's supposed to be the name on your birth record. Now, the thing they're giving us for a birth record is actually called a certificate of live birth. And if you, you know, like in Michigan, if you went and found the Vital Statistics Act and said, well, when do they use a certificate of live birth? It'll say, well, they only use that for uh, adoptions and births out of wedlock. Okay, so, you know, myself, I'd have to use Robert Allen Rutluski. I couldn't use Robert A. You got people using middle initials. You got people putting names in a parentheses or in uh, quotes. Right? This is a freaking joke. Well, these, you know, uh, people committing treason now are then going to take another oath to get access to classified information. Right? The same people using these same fictitious names are going to use it on an oath. Well, at a time of war, one of the first uh, boxes to check to say that somebody is a spy is if they're not using their identification. And these people aren't using their identification. All right? So th this is Congress. Well, your House of Representatives, your, I mean, your, your state legislature did the same thing. The senators did the same thing. Uh, your governor did the same thing. The judges all did the same thing, federal or state. goes on and on and on. There's nobody, sir, that's taken a proper oath of office in the United States except the military. Because we don't have to take this particular oath. right? They have an oath for the enlisted, which I took, and they have an oath for the officers, which you took. And Well, then, you know, we're styling and profiling. We are in charge of the United States, but we're not using it. So let's get back to that flag for a minute. Uh, hang on a second. Okay, sir, it's Army Regulation 840-10, 840-10 on flags, got on streamers and so forth and so on. And, you know, it's got all sorts of interesting information in it. But uh, for our purposes, if we were to go to Chapter 2, Flag of the United States, right? Not United States of America, Flag of the United States. He'll tell you all about it, and he'll get these sizes and occasions and so forth, and he'll start telling you that uh, the national flags below are for indoor display and for use in ceremonies and parades. For the purpose of the flag of the United States will be rayon, banner cloth, heavyweight nylon, trimmed to three sides with gold and yellow fringe, two and a half inches wide. You have one of those in your church. Right, well, where is it authorized to be displayed? The flag of the United States is authorized for indoor display for each. And it goes through these different places, but they all are tied to the military. Well, one of the places it's tied is a chapel, right, which is part of the military. So here it says, um, military offices not otherwise authorize an indoor flag on the United States for the purpose of administering oaths of office. Military courtrooms. It doesn't say anything about a civilian courtroom, sir, but when you go to court, there'll be a gold fringe flag in there. Well, then, you know, it has to be military court, sir. Something going on. And so, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, the flag of the United States position manner. So that's for indoor display. Now, if you find one outdoor, unless it's private use, right, then the places that it is, that means that that place is attached to the military. So you see it at courthouses and libraries and uh, schools is like the only place where this, you know, they're allowed to have private display. And then private people can have private display. But a public entity cannot cannot display a gold uh, a flag on a flagpole, 
unless they're attached to the military. So, you know, the post office, the hospital, all these places have got freaking gold, like half legs. They're all in this flagged um, jurisdiction. Well, so is the churches because you have a gold fringe flag, right? So I don't know. They make you, did they turn the church into a chapel? Because we're not talking about the religious part of the church. We're talking about this organization we're going to look at now that was created. Um, uh, right. Uh, American Catholics in the War, National War Council. Right. If you were to Google that, you can find this book that really explains it quite well. It actually shows the letters, or the, at least the text that went from the that the president sent out, that the bishops replied to, that they got a reply to, and then they ended up creating this thing called the National Catholic War Council, which is now the um, USCCB. Right? It's a civilian, a civil entity. It's not attached to the church. It's you know. Uh, registered just like any other, let's call it an NGO. I guess that's probably what it would be. It's a non-government uh, organization. <laughs> and it still exists. Well, this book's kind of long to, you know, more than I want to read right now, but just to show you the thing actually existed, well, here's a bulletin they put out June 1st, 1919, the National Catholic War Council. And uh, in here, it Right? In a letter to the National Catholic War Council, which is published in full every, uh, elsewhere in the bulletin, the Honorary, Honorable Franklin Roosevelt, Acting Secretary of the Navy, declares the helpfulness and efficiency of our organization has proven powerful aid in the contentment and fighting spirit of the Navy. The department is desirous for your excellent work to be continued and that the naval service, whether the country be at peace or war, have the benefit of your splendid cooperation. da 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 da, -da. Well, it's, you know, there's, there's still chaplains in the service, right? This is where all this, had, you know, came into being. And I'm saying because your church has got a gold fringe flag that uh, you have civil jurisdiction in that, uh, in that particular jurisdiction. So, um, yeah, hang on one more minute. Right, uh, the purpose of the National Catholic War Council was felt to be, and has proven itself to be, the authoritative inspiration and direction of American Catholicism in dealing with problems of the war and even graver problems that would follow the war. Uh, hence, the National Catholic War Council was composed first of the 14 archbishops of four metropolitans, as they are called in the United States. Right, this is where it started. Yeah, this little paragraph here explains it quite well. Uh, with the entrance of our country into the war, the Catholic Church of the United States, through its archbishops, expressed the loyalty of Catholics and proffered their services to President Wilson in a message recognized as one of the major events of history of the war in our country. Then followed the practical task of transforming the high idealism and spiritual inspiration of this message into terms of action. Complex and unprecedented problems of war relief and Civic cooperation confronted Catholics with difficulties of special kind. Yada, yada, yada. But there was lacking a mechanism for the United National Cooperation as Catholics with the various government agencies charged with conduct of the war and of war relief. All right, and that's the key sentence there, sir, because that's what this National Catholic War Council became is this agency of the church that had the authority to cooperate with other agencies of the war effort. Right? Which is much better covered in this other document. If I can get the name of it here. Right? Right here. The Handbook of the National Catholic War Council. Now all this stuff, you know, is uh, at the, uh, what's the name of the University in Washington, D.C., Catholic University. You know, they have a, you know, all the records are stored there, but most of these things I'm showing you, obviously, I found them online. 
okay, so the archbishops did their thing, and they created this overarching thing called the National Catholic Board Council, but then they broke it down, right? And uh, so a formation of a diocese and war council. Well, guess who's in charge of that? Sir, of course, the, the bishop is. Right, so whether any of the other structure is there, the bishop is still the diocese and war council. He has the authority. But they did, the idea of all this was to put the, put the power in the hands of the local parish. And it wasn't just the Catholic Church. I'm, you know, I'm speaking to you, obviously, because you're a Catholic priest. But this was for all the churches. All, all these entities got a deal with the federal government. In fact, if you were to look uh, between the Supreme, right next to the Supreme Court is a building called the uh, the Methodist building, right? That whoever was in charge of the Methodist back in 1917, after the you know they got their deal, went and found the spot and built a building. But the Methodists are really tied directly to England. They have their charter to exist through the Court of Chancery in England. You know, it's not a United States organization. They may be here acting as a foreign uh, entity, but their formation is actually in the government of uh, England because the Court of Chancery is part of the, you know, one of the four royal courts of England. And that's where they have their charter from, is from England. Right? And yet they have a building right next to the Supreme Court. I wonder who they're representing. You know, I'd say they're representing the United States of America. Uh, okay, I'll get on to this real quick. Right, cooperative work of the parishes, the parish and the Supreme Testing Place, length of breath, depth of patriotism. The world will never be the same after the Great War. Right, this war is the war of Christian morality against pagan materialism, and there is a greater crisis to come in the moral world after the well, they had this pretty much figured out, right? They, they knew what was going to happen. It is needless to emphasize that in the perfection of Catholic organization, the parochial unit is the heart of the Catholic endeavor, right? They wanted to put the power in the hands of the people. And uh, when thus organized, the parochial war units of the diocese have in their power, therefore, to form a strong central organization in which no single aspect of war service will be denied its legitimate place. These units should endeavor to seek out all existing forces in the parish and bring them into intelligent and sympathetic relationship so that all waste and friction and inefficiency may be avoided. Right? Now, if you look at the parish as being a territorial land, well, there's all sorts of things. we got the police in there, a fire department, uh, city hall, you know, all of these things. And so all of these entities all have gold fringe flags. Right? So it's, you know, it's this unity of the flag that the, ch the church through these uh, secular organizations have um, have a voice. Uh, these units should be thoroughly in one spirit. Method of the Diocese Work Council may be uh, prepared and give an adequate cooperation with new problems, war service, reconstruction, which may have to be faced when the war is over. Well, go figure. That's where we're at. But, and this is the gist of this, and then we'll move on. I, I wanted to get to this here. This is chapter four, right? Uh, governmental and supplemental agencies in the war work, right? Where no individual in the great land of ours can stand without a circle of war workers. And uh, cooperation organization bodies and the lands best suited for the work of government to outline the support. At the end of the day, they they don't want to have to deal with people individually. They want the people to go through some kind of agency for anything they need from another agency of the wartime government, right? And this is uh, so that's why they created this thing, is so that they could cooperate with these other agencies. With perfect service of a jurisdiction, it's one of the most vital factors of the nation's life, whether at war or time of peace. The Catholic Church stands as the most stable moral force within the nation. Well, there you are. 
uh, the different Protestant denominations have organized for war purposes under the title the General Wartime Commission of the Federal Churches of Christ in America and the Jews under the Jewish Welfare Board of the United States Army and Navy. Right? Everybody had created some kind of organization. Right? All these are asked to cooperate with government agencies on war work. Well, the war is still going on. It's never ended. There's no there's no peace treaty. There wasn't a peace treaty after the First World War. They tried to get one, but they never got ratified. Right? No peace treaty after the Second War, after the Korean War, Vietnam War, War on Drugs, First Gulf War, Second Gulf War, Afghanistan War. God, did I miss any? Oh, the Cold War, right? There's never been any peace treaties after any of those wars. And so technically, as a member of the military, that once you go into the military, you never come out. Right? All, all, all veterans are still in the military. We, we never got a discharge order. I've done many videos on this, sir. So, you know, we're still in the military. Well, there's things that we could get because we were in the military that we can only get by using this system here of these uh, organizations. I'll show you in just a second. But it was the whole idea. These are the principal agencies that we're supposed to be cooperating with, right? One of them is the Department of the Treasury. So this is, you know, the parish war council led by the parish priest and a number of uh, the laity that make up the war council have the authority to interact with these other agencies. And so one of them is, right, the Department of Treasury. So that's a wartime agency. The Department of Treasury is a wartime agency. They just said so. And yet it's still called today the Department of Treasury. So apparently, you know, it's still a wartime agency. And anyways, this, uh, the, so Treasury had to do with the uh, certain disability and death benefits and so forth and so on. But it goes down here that even today, I want to get to this section. In addition to administering the War Risk Insurance Act, the Bureau of War Risk Insurance is authorized to act for men in the active military service under the provisions of the Soldiers, Sailors, and Relief Act, Civil Relief Act, approved March 8, 1918, in the matter of lapsing or forfeiture of certain specified life insurance contracts, either in life insurance companies or fraternal or organizations. Well, if we've never been released from the military, then we still have our military life insurance they gave us to us when we were in the military. And we should be able to either cash those in or um, for veterans who have died, you know, the proceeds should be going to their... Um, their dependents. But they've lapsed. They've been forfeited. There's something wrong with the paperwork. There's an error. There's an omission. There's lawyers have been involved. Esquires have been involved. Uh, accountants have been involved. Doctors have been involved. All these professionals have been involved. Make sure there's errors and omissions and records. And pretty soon the names don't match on the paperwork. And, you know, we really can't put it all together. We're, we don't know what to do. Well, we can't go talk to them as individuals because they have a gold French flag. That's a uh, wartime organization, right? And we're not supposed to go directly to them as individuals. We're supposed to go to them through an agency. And that's what they made the freaking church an agent, right? Uh, a cooperating agent, they call it, with the wartime, these other wartime agencies. Right? Well, then another one's the Department of War and Navy. Right, so you have direct access to the Department of War and Navy through this uh, parochial um, wartime council. And so we're going to leave this now, sir. But all I'm saying is, you know, you're a priest in the church. Go ask the freaking uh, diocesan bishop, where's the, where's the war council at? All right, it's still there, sir. Didn't go away. War's still going. You got the gold French flag. Somebody got some explaining to do.
right? Because it could do a lot of good for the people in the parish. Okay, a couple more things to talk about. Hang on a second. I just real quick, sir. This is uh, the uh, Catholic uh, Encyclopedia talking about chaplains, right? And it goes through the history and so forth. And well, one of the things it says is that you know they have spiritual jurisdiction. Okay. Well, another thing about a chaplain is that a chaplain is actually an officer or a member. Let me use the word officer for now of the organization that requested the chaplain. Right, because, uh, for instance, the House of Representatives has a chaplain. He's an officer of the House of Representatives. Same with the chaplain of the Senate. So I'm saying that because you have a gold fringe flag in your church, looks something like that, that, uh, and the Army regulation says, well, they can be displayed in a chapel, and chapels have chaplains, well, then somehow somebody at the church became a chaplain. And because they're a chaplain, they have authority in the secular jurisdiction that gave them the uh, authority to be the chaplain. Right? So, um, what do we use it for? Well, that's the thing. What can we use that for? Well, this is what I believe. That because we're talking about this military jurisdiction in the first place, that... Uh, the sworn statement form used by the military is something that somebody like me could use if I had somebody to do the uh, affidavit at the end. Because, it's, But it shows for routine uses, right, that information provided may be further disclosed to federal, state, local, foreign law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, courts, child protective services, Victims, witnesses, Department of Veterans Affairs, Office of Personnel Management, and so forth and so on. I mean, it's used for all sorts of things. And it's just a sworn statement form where I, you know, whoever the I is, this would be the person, da 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 da, fill in the blank, write your statement, go to the last page, and you got this affidavit. Where it says I again, right? And these witnesses <laughs> are involved, but. This person over here, signature of the person administering the oath. I say that could be you, sir, because you have a gold fringe flag. Right? And if that's all it took for this thing with witnesses to have the authority it's supposed to have, what would be like a really powerful document? Because it would be a document that had been executed by people from that jurisdiction. Right? So a notary, a notary public cannot do this. Because they're not from the gold fringe jurisdiction. But you are. Because you got a gold fringe flag. See how easy that was? In fact, this is how powerful this is, right? You got an affidavit. You got uh, the person giving the affidavit. You got two witnesses. Let's remember that for just a second. Let's go look at something in a definition of the, uh, what do you call that? A sh shadow call? As a closing protocol, a final section of legal document or public, a legal or public document may include formulaic sentences of appreciation, so forth and so on. Anyways, it turns out these things have particular words in them. And a self-proof clause, right, because it could be used for a jurat or a testimonium or an attestation or a subscription or a venue, all these different things. But one of them is a self-proof clause. Well, there's a thing. In the Federal Rules of Evidence, that talk about having self-authenticating documents. That's what this is. It proves by itself that it is what it is. It typically, presents, uh, typically presents only in wills and consisting of affidavits of a testator and the witnesses that the document was duly executed, which affidavits permit uh, the will to be legally proven without further testimony, as to its authenticity. Well, you know, the word will doesn't mean that when you die, it means, you know, your intent. What is it you want to do? It's my will to do this. Right? Doing the will of the Lord. So if you have the testator, the person who's doing it, taking the affidavit, and witnesses, then, um, actually, the testator, 
testator. That may be who the person is giving the oath. No, that can't be the person giving the oath. But you have witnesses, right? You got uh, three witnesses: the person giving the oath, and then the two witnesses uh, that were going to be on the document next to it, right? So you got three witnesses and the person doing it. Well, that would make this a self-authenticating uh, as evidence, and it wouldn't take any further proof. And I'm saying this now, talking to you, but for other people who watched my videos in the past, maybe you could do this with uh, Notary Public. Right, not in this form, but you could use this as the affidavit of your sworn statement to make it self-proof evidence by having three witnesses. All right, I have to show that in another video maybe, but I'm just thinking about it as, a, as I'm looking at it. Okay, back to the, while we're here, I'll wrap this thing up. So, um, I just want to show a couple of examples, sir. Where the devil is in the details. Right, and uh, put their errors and omissions put in there by people doing the work of the devil. Sit in church, uh, you know, call themselves a Christian, but they're an esquire. Right, so here's an example. This is a court case I'm helping Tammy with, where we had actually filed a case into the state court, which was determined they were going to take it out and bring it to the federal court. Because the plaintiff, the defendant, was the United States. Not the United States of America. They changed it to the United States of America. But we had it against the United States. But, you know, this wasn't our doing. They just said they did this, and here comes this paper. Well, and here's who said they did it, right? David A. Hubert and Edward J. Murphy. Well, neither of those, well, first of all, David didn't sign it. And somebody signed for Edward J. Murphy. But there is no Edward J. Murphy that has any authority as an attorney in the United States. Because you cannot use the middle initial in your full legal name. Right? It's part of the Real ID Act. Well, it's it's they talk about the Real ID Act, but it's just your legal name. You have to use your legal name in legal matters. And this person didn't use his legal name. This isn't the name that he became an attorney with. It's not the name that's on his driver's license. It's not the name that allows him to practice in this particular court because any court they want to practice in, they got to fill out some paperwork for. Right? They make him use their full legal name. I've seen the documents. I haven't seen his, but you know, I've seen one. That's enough. They're not using their full legal name. So this person, this document was entered into a court case, but it wasn't signed. Nobody signed the document. Well, it turns out there's a rule that says if you didn't sign your document, and you're told about it, and you don't fix it, well, then it has to be struck from the record. So, you know, in this case, this record had to be struck. Now, this is how it is on every document that's filed by an attorney. They don't sign their own documents. A lot of times you see like a byline where it just says, by, with somebody's name here, who did sign it, you know, with their information, but they're signing for this person above. Well, that isn't the attorney of record signing his own document. Right? That's somebody signing for him, and you can't do that. <laughs> All right, so, uh, you know, uh, so in this case, and we were trying to file this motion. In fact, this just got filed in today. We'll see what happens, right? We'll see if they pay attention to it. Uh, request order striking documents lacking signature of attorney of record. Right? Uh, take judicial notice. The proper name of the defendant is, in this case, United States. No appearance of counsel has been filed. Right? They're supposed to say, hey, we're here to represent the defendant. Well, they didn't file any appearance. Um, these esquires, they changed the name of the defendant, the United States of America, when it's supposed to be the United States. Playing, playing to see already, there's two different entities. And then, you know, at this point, they had filed, <coughs> excuse me, these particular documents here. And none of them have a signature on it. So, you know, hey, Strike the records, right? And if they were to strike this, then that would mean that the defendant never showed up, so now they're in contempt of court, and, uh, well, you're on your way to winning your case. So this would be a lot stronger if the document that we had started with had, you know, gold fringe flag authority on it when we, when we went to court. Because we're not supposed to go to these agencies directly ourselves. We're supposed to go, you know, through this, through an agency that's been given 
the authority to act with other agencies. And all I'm saying, sir, is that's you doing this for us right here. If the uh, parochial war council had the authority to be administering this stuff, right, um, and where their authority came from and so forth, or if it's just the, the chaplain, you as a chaplain or a member of the uh, parochial war council who was given the authority to do this, right, so that we could get these oaths done, so we could have our documents we need to go file into these different places, such as the Department of Veterans Affairs. Because I'm going to show you one more thing and I'm done, but this is now we're getting close to home with veterans. Right? Um, sir, have you ever gotten your My Healthy Vet personal information report? Well, if you ever get one, which I'm sure you can, you're a veteran, right? You start looking at it, you see all these things on there that uh, make you want to say what? And it took me a while to, to realize the one in the middle of the page is the biggest one, that this document has been classified confidential. Well, that's a national security classification. Why is my, you know, my health record a matter of national security? And we'll find out, you know, I did a video on this that, uh, in fact, I'm going to go make sure I show you that link. Hang on. Yeah, uh, veterans' records are a matter of national security, right? Please watch that video, sir. It's, uh, you know, I can't, I'm not going to go into all that again now. I'm going to wrap this thing up. I'm just showing you that they've made veterans' records confidential, and the reason they did it is because they have errors in them that they don't want people to be able to fix. And if you can't fix the errors in your records, then you can't get the, the, um, your entitlements. So they have my name as Rutluski, comma, Robert A. Right? It's not my name. My name is Robert Allen Rutluski. Well, as you you know, you start looking at the different ways your name is used on different documents. There's all sorts of ways they're using them. Right? This document has my birth date wrong. My birthday is September 5th. And they have September 1st. And then this talks about all these different places that uh, these documents come from when you download this request. Right? Again, this is called My Healthy Vet. If you haven't done it, you'll take, take a bit, bit of time to figure it out. But you can sign up online to be able to download your personal information report, which is confidential, which made it a matter of national security. And you start looking at it and say, well, if this is national security, then who are all these people that are looking at my records? Because all these other entities here had something to do with this account. And only one of them, I mean, VAMC is supposed to be VA Medical Center, I guess. It doesn't say that it is. But who's all the others? Right? And then it has my information wrong, right? It's got Robert A. Rutluski, September 1st. I, I never put that date in there. Then you got VA Demographics, which has Robert A. Rutluski with a wrong birth date. That says that the county I live in is county number 81. Now, I live in Kent County, Michigan. I don't live in county 81. I mean, there, there's no way Kent County gets to be number 81. There's, you know, there's like 90-some or 80-some, 86. I don't remember how many counties in Michigan. But, you know, Kent County is like in the 40s if you're doing it numerically. So, you know, th this information came from the VA. Well, it's incorrect. And as you can see, again, every page confidential. This is a confidential record, sir. This is national security. There's confidential, secret, top secret. But, you know, people are messing with shit that you go to jail for. I, for a bit of my career in the military, I was in a signal unit. And I know a bit about, you know, confidential, Se top secret and secret. And uh, this isn't any of those. And then you get to this section down here where this is supposed to be from the DOD section of information that came to the VA to get incorporated into this document that has to do with this thing called DEERS. And the DEERS system determines if you get to have an ID card or not. And... Everybody who's a veteran should have an ID card. 
that shows that they're still in the military. I mean, a I'm talking about having a uh, Geneva Convention ID card because we were never released. Well, this whole thing is empty, right? It's got my dates wrong. I was uh, I actually, hey, when I first time out, I was a starter. I was an E5. They got me as a corporal. And they have these dates wrong. Like on my DD-214, it says the 16th, and this says the 17th. They don't have any MOS, no separation pay, no combat pay, no retirement pay. All right, everything is empty. And so, you know, I've tried to fix this through the VA, but the records would have to be fixed by going to the privacy officer. Who I called three different times, he never called me back. Well, come to find out, you know, all this shit's confidential. So, you know, I need to have a, you know, that's what I'm saying. I need to have somebody from the Gold Fringe Flag Society, Gold Fringe Flag uh, jurisdiction, give me my one document I need to, you know, push it through, which would be this sworn statement for me. Okay, so, again, uh, Reverend Daniel Nolan, talking to you, sir. Thank you for your service. And uh, just so everybody knows, hey, the lieutenant is a ring knocker. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Served three years active duty in the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah. Okay, somebody have the lieutenant give me a call. 616-712-6179. Or if you feel better, just send me an email. All right, we'll just start slow. But uh, we should, we need to talk and get this thing figured out. All right, thank you very much. And uh, God bless. Bye-bye.